So welcome again, everyone, to the next episode of Paving the Way Home. And once again, we're delighted to be joined by Father Eunan MacDonald, the provincial of the Irish province of the Salesians of St. John Bosco. Uh, you're very welcome, Father Eunan. Thank you, Brian. Good to be thanks back. A million for, thanks a million for joining us again. So we're in the, we're in the middle of our, our series on, on, on prayer. And just before actually uh, we get into this, we'll begin as usual just with a prayer, if you would kindly lead us, Father Eunan. Surely. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray to you, God the Father, who sent the Holy Spirit to bring new light to our hearts. Just as the apostles were huddled in fear behind locked doors, you, Jesus, were able through the power of the Spirit to enter into their hearts and bring your peace. We pray, Lord, that whatever defences we may have in place, that you may gently make your way through those defences so that we can receive your peace and your love. We ask this through the power of your Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. Holy Spirit, direct, guide and enlighten us. Amen. Thank you, Father Eunan. Um, so, Father Eunan, um, this, this series so far in prayer has been, uh, has been absolutely fantastic. There's been such fantastic uh, feedback as well from, from so many people because um, as we referred to in, in previous episodes, this is a type of prayer that Christian meditation, a type of prayer that not everyone is, is used to. Um, we're all very used to uh, our devotions and, uh, and talking to God, which is which are so important uh, as well. But there's a, this type of prayer, particularly, you know, it takes up a huge section uh, in, in, in the catechism. Uh, and it's a prayer that, it's a, it's a type of prayer that takes a lot of practice. And, and when you're starting out, it can be, it can be a, little bit, uh, a little bit daunting, a little bit alien to us. Um, but over the, the, the last three episodes, you're going through it uh, fantastically. And when we finished the last day, we finished um, on Lectio Divina, but we weren't fully finished in it. So I think you wanted to go uh, a little bit further with the Lectio Divina. Truly, yes, Brian. In the last day when we were talking about Lex Divina, I took some uh, episodes from the, from the New Testament to help us to understand what Lex Divina is about. The goal of Lex Divina, we must never forget. The goal is encounter with Christ. So we're praying with the word of God in order to be open to receive the presence of God in and through Christ. So encounter with Christ. So although I mentioned the four different stages of Lex Divina, the Lexio, Meditatio, Oratio, Contemplatio, which is basically reading the word of God and staying with it. Meditatio is chewing the word of God. So it goes deeper, we ruminate the word of God. Then the third stage is praying from the word of God, not what we normally want to pray for, but what God is now asking us to pray for, having listened to his word. So listening to his word becomes a response to God then in prayer. And then the contemplatio is where we enjoy God's presence, where we enjoy his presence. And that is the ultimate aim for that encounter to be present to God. So therefore, if the contemplatio happens at an earlier stage, you don't go through the stages. But you, 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 once, you see, the key thing here is to remember, we start with our effort under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But gradually God takes over. And when God takes over, we go with what God is doing. So we put ourselves more into a position of receiving from God. So again, I go back to that image of Francis de Sales is when we meditate, we're rowing the boat. But when we contemplate is when the sails, the, the breeze of God's spirit has taken the sails and there's no effort on our part, we begin to move with it. So it's a difference between meditation and contemplation. And Alexa Divina is to bring us to that place of contemplation where we actually no longer need words, but enjoy the presence of God. Yeah, that's fantastic. There's a, there's a point you made there, and I'm just going to come back to us, where 
you say in this form of prayer, you get to a point where it's God is telling us what to pray for. And that's amazing because, you know, we can grow up our whole lives um, and also intercessory prayer is so important, but we're almost telling God what we're praying for. But this idea, this concept of listening to God and allowing God to put into the into our hearts what he wants us to pray for. So it's complete submission to God, to the spirit of God. Um, and, and, and that itself is a, that itself can, is actually is, is a strange prospect to, to many people. Yeah, and maybe I could concretize it with an example from my own life. In one of the lecture divinos, I would have done myself. I was praying uh, in community. We were doing lecture divina, and we were doing it on the story of Zacchaeus. Now, I would read the story of Zacchaeus many times, and also prayed with it imaginatively. But this was the first time I did a lecture divina on Zacchaeus, and the phrase which stood out for me, and which I then stayed with is a phrase which I didn't realize was actually in the story at all. And the phrase was, he stood his ground. And for the life of me, I couldn't understand why was this phrase, why was this phrase so important for me? Because I couldn't connect with it, but I knew God was saying to me, this is important. So I had to stay with the phrase. The following day, when we're at mass, in the first reading, <clears throat> it was from Ephesians. And the text was, you must rely on God's armor or you will be unable to put up any resistance or have enough resources to stand your ground. Wow. So whenever that phrase was there, obviously it kind of leapt out at me. So I said, God obviously is communicating something to me. So in the oratio stage, in the prayer, I didn't know what exactly to pray for because I didn't know what God was saying to me. But I, was, I prayed to God to say, God, give me the clarity to know when to stand my ground and stand on you, on your truth and on your love in particular situations. Well, <laughs> that coming week, there were a few situations where I really had to stand my ground. And this really made me realize that God was preparing me for this. But later, six months later, the real significance of the phrase came to me. Because in the meantime, I'd been asked to prepare a talk for the superior generals of all the congregations of the world in Rome. And I hadn't a clue. I, I don't know where to start with this. I hadn't a clue how to go about it. And it was on the theme of vocation. So I was praying about it. And when I prayed about it, the phrase came back to me. You must stand your ground. And then it became very clear to me. I used the story of Zacchaeus to illustrate through Alexio Divina what vocation actually means. How was he able to stand his ground? Because the people were all murmuring about him to Jesus, but didn't affect him. He stood his ground and he was able to give all his money away. But the reason why he was able to stand his ground was because he had allowed himself to be loved by God. And the experience of being loved by God meant he didn't need to hold on to the compensations to the money. It no longer meant anything to him. As long as he was insecure, he needed to hold on to money to give himself prestige. But once he understood he was loved by God, by Jesus, then he was able to give it away. He was able to stand his ground. And that is the fundamental vocation of each person, to let yourself be loved by God. But it's the most difficult thing to do. It's just uh, striking me there as you're, uh, as you're saying that. And when you spent this time in prayer, you listened to God, God spoke to you. And even as you left that particular um, moment of prayer, you were not you were not quite sure what way uh, God was going to reveal himself to you. But I suppose the whole point I'm getting to is that, you know, sometimes sometimes we can put our 10, 20, 30 minutes, even an hour aside for prayer with God. And once that 
prayer session, so to speak, is finished. We didn't move on with the rest of our lives and we can kind of almost forget about God. What was really coming at me there as you were speaking is that as we leave prayer, as we leave whatever time we spend with God, we're still incorporating God into every aspect of our life, whether it's our work, our relationships, our families, everything. Uh, you know, maybe sometimes we can fall into the trap of, you know, God is for the half an hour, an hour on a Sunday morning uh, when we go to mass. But in the rest of the week, the relationships, everything, you know, he doesn't really play any part or have any um, influence or uh, and, and anything in any of those things. But with you, as you left that prayer, God was still working. God was, 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 was revealing himself to you very slowly in his own time, in his own way, in the way that he knew that uh, was suited to you. Um, and as these relationships, whether it was in work or family or whatever, whatever it is, this moment of prayer, this time of prayer, God was now revealing himself even more so in these relationships, whether it was work, whether it was these meetings or, or whatever. And uh, that was just a, a, a point uh, I, I wanted to make there um, and just very struck me very much as, as you were talking. The other thing as well was how important patience and silence was uh, in that because as those words from the, from the gospel piece with Zacchaeus was striking you, you still were unsure as to what exactly it meant, what God was telling you. But as you left that prayer, you were open, you, you were completely open and submissive to whatever God wanted to tell you, whatever he wanted to reveal to you. But it was, good, it was going to be in God's own time. It wasn't as if we had to, we, we were able to rush. You were able even to rush the answer and say, all right, God, I have five minutes left in my prayer. I need the answer now. And, you know, last night as we were praying the rosary here with our, um, the family, yes, to be a Monday, we were praying the Joyful Mysteries. And when it came to the fourth Joyful Mystery, uh, it was something I was thinking of when the Holy Family, they brought Jesus to the temple to present him to the Lord. And when they met Simeon, who'd, who had been told by the Holy Spirit, that he would not die without seeing the Messiah. And yet here he was at the very end of his life. And surely he must have thought, gosh, maybe I got that wrong. Because look, my life is over. There's no sign. And almost on the 11th hour, the Messiah is, 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 is brought to him. And again, that whole thing of, of patience, complete patience, even if it goes to the 11th hour, but it's in God's time. And we have to be completely open uh, and submissive to, uh, to whatever way God is directing us. A very good uh, valid point you're making about the silence and the patience and allowing things to happen in God's time. And I've had the opposite experience as well, too. There's been times in prayer where I've wanted God to give me an answer immediately, and I have not received the answer immediately in that sense. I remember when I was doing my 30 day retreat, 30 days of complete silence. So you had periods of prayer during the day. And during the retreat, at one point, I could find myself getting very angry and very annoyed because the interesting thing is whenever you go into silence, stuff begins to emerge that you normally don't think about, but you push down. But in silence, it begins to emerge. Stuff going back even from childhood can begin to emerge in that regard. And I remember being quite annoyed and angry with God because I felt there were situations where I felt he wasn't present, where I needed him and he hadn't been present. And I could find myself, the more I thought about it, I was getting more annoyed and more angry. And at one stage then, I had to stop really focusing on that because I realized that my anger itself was blocking me from being open to what God wanted to say. So I, needed, I knew I needed to move on, but it was unresolved and I left it. And it was interesting because when I was walking around, I noticed a big wooden cross on the ground, which I hadn't seen for the three weeks previous. But the reason why I saw it now was they had cut the grass and what had been buried was now exposed. So in a way, it was a bit like that. What was going on inside of me was something that had been buried quite deep. And now God was bringing up for healing in the prayer time. But all I was experiencing at that stage was kind of anger with God or annoyance with God because I believe he wasn't there when I needed him most in that sense in, in, in childhood. So then what happened was several months later, more than six months later, when I least expected it, I got an answer to that prayer. 
So God in his own time, in his own way, answered the prayer. And I got the answer, not when I was praying, but when I was in the shower of all things. Because this phrase came into my mind and I knew it was a phrase that only God could put into my mind. It wasn't coming from me. And the phrase was, but you know, did you not know, this was Jesus was saying, did you not know that I was with you and within you when you were suffering? We never suffer on our own. When we suffer, Christ suffers with us and within us. That's the meaning of the cross. His story is also our story. And what I learned from that was that, you know how it says in the gospel where, where Jesus says, whatever you do to the least of my brothers or sisters, you do to me. It's equally true to say that whatever anybody does to you, he does to Christ in you as well. It's so easy to fall into that trap of, you know, we, we, whatever suffering, whatever crosses we're carrying and we bring it to God, and almost wondering, is he at times, is he listening? Does he hear me? I'm pouring out my heart here and I feel nothing. It's very dangerous, I guess, to make decisions based on feelings uh, and emotions at times, depending on the circumstances. But that's powerful. That's a very powerful image there of you, the, of what you said there of Jesus, Jesus accompanying. And it also, it really kind of reminds me, I guess, of that prayer of the footprints in the stands. Um, you know, that so many of the viewers will probably be familiar with. I don't know the exact words again, but it's more or less when there was only one set of footprints uh, and the person asked, where, where were you? And, it was, and Jesus was saying, well, they're my footprints because I was carrying you. Exactly. Yes. And I was thinking of another experience because sometimes the reason why I tell experiences by prayer, it's not about me. It's about what God is doing in the prayer. And this is very important for us to realize. We do not share our experience by prayer to say there's something great about me because it's not us at all. It's what God is doing in our prayer. And that's the difference between encountering God in prayer and your ideas about God. And there's a world of a difference because when you encounter God in prayer, you're building a friendship, a relationship with God. And sometimes he has to break through your ideas. Sometimes it's your mind, your thoughts are actually getting in the way of you being open to experiencing God in a new way. Sometimes it's your feelings that are blocking you from being open to God. Like, like my anger or my annoyance was a block. Now, sometimes it's good to actually bring that annoyance and anger to God and let him work on it. But sometimes, too, we have to be humble enough to acknowledge that whenever we're angry or annoyed, it really does limit our perspective. We're wearing blinkers when we're angry and when we're annoyed. We don't see the whole picture. We're looking at it in a very particular kind of way. And sometimes God needs to be able to break through that. But for God to break through it, we need to give him the time and the space to do so. Because our feelings are the block, are, are the defense, are the protection from looking at it differently or looking at it the way that God is looking at it. In that sense and that kind of exposes ourselves uh, uh, francis de Sales says something very very good he says there was never an angry person who thought they were wrong when you're angry you're always right you see so pride follows very quickly on the heels of anger and it's true of our relations with anybody or with god when we we're angry we feel we're right and god needs to see it our way and we're not open enough to see it god's way so we need humility to recognize, okay, I'm angry, but maybe I don't see the whole picture. Maybe what I'm thinking, I don't have to believe everything I think or everything I feel. Maybe there's more to it and to allow God to show me the more that's there. That's a point you brought up as well in, um, in, in one of the previous talks. And the next question I was going to ask um, just before you answer that one, it's a tricky, probably an unfair question to put on somebody uh, on the spot, but when you're in that position and you're so overcome or whatever emotion, whether especially if it's anger or hurt or whatever, how do you put that aside? How do you come into prayer and sit with God knowing that you actually just need to, to, to put this aside? Because I think, as you said in a in previous talk, because you need to be able to go right down deep 
to the almost to the foundations to where God is at um, and spend it. And what would you, what advice, what practical advice would you give to anyone that is just unable to do that, is just not come into prayer, but they're just not able to get past that anger or whatever emotion they're, they're experiencing? I would say walk. <laughs> In fact, I wouldn't say sit there, especially if, if you can't. Um, what I have found essential sometimes, and sometimes vocal prayer is necessary at that point, rather than trying meditation. Because sometimes when, when we're very stirred up, okay, when, we're, when the emotions are very alive, okay, it, it can be very difficult to settle yourself, to settle yourself in that regards. And what I find useful in that regards is to go walking and just and tell the Lord how I feel. Tell, I'm, I did that a number of times in that retreat. I told, Lord, this is what I'm feeling. This is me being real with you. You know, maybe I'm not seeing the whole picture, but help me to see more. Okay. But I'm quite annoyed and quite angry at this moment. And I need you to enter into that feeling. I need you to enter into the feeling. And what you begin to find that over time, when you bring the, the feeling into prayer or allow the Lord to enter into the feeling, a gap is created between the feeling and yourself. It's not as intense and it creates an openness to look at it differently or to hear differently. Now, another way that I have found helpful, I don't know if I mentioned it before, but you see the picture behind me, okay, which reminds me, we were to do a meditation um, for the listeners, but we changed the format because I felt that if I sat here doing a meditation with you, it wouldn't really work that well. So I, I gave the meditation to you, which you will um, give as an MP3 so people can hear the audio version of it. So it will help them to do that meditation. And part of it is based on this piece of scripture in John chapter 21, where Jesus meets the disciples on the shore after the fishing. Okay. During my 30 day retreat, it became a very significant piece of scripture for me personally, because during that, when I was praying with this piece of scripture in imaginative prayer, in the Ignatian way of prayer, I found myself with Jesus at the fire and we were discussing certain things and he got me to focus on the fire to understand the fire of his love. And he's also asking me to put on the fire, the anger, the annoyance, or things that weren't working for me, to put it on the fire. And even to think of people whom I had been annoyed with or angry with, to place that like a log on the fire so it would ascend as a, go up to God the Father and come back as a blessing on those people in that sense. So one of the things I find helpful in prayer are when I'm really angry or really annoyed or stuff is really not, or frustrated or disappointed when things are not working for me. What I do often is I go walking, I go walking and I use it as a log and I put it on that fire between Jesus and myself. So I place it on the fire of his love and ask him then to deal with it or to take care with it. And when I was with my spiritual director uh, during that period of the retreat, she reflected back to me something which I hadn't realized, my own words. But when she said it, it had a huge impact on me. And what she said to me, so there's fire between you. There's fire between you. And that was so true. What I was focusing on was the difficulties or the problems where Jesus was trying to get me to focus on the intimacy between him and me, the fire of love that existed between us. And to put everything on that fire of the love between us. You spoke there, Father Union, about you just made a reference there while I go to just uh, you know the various forms of uh, imaginative prayer, uh, and there are because you know there are different there are different types of prayer that may suit um, different personalities or whatever. You know, um, I think you, you you spoke before that you know some people are very imaginative or fantastic at, at picturing things where I think you said yourself that you wouldn't be great with picturing things but more so uh, with words um, and that could you go into that uh, a little bit for us could surely yeah um, in the tradition of Christian meditation there are two strands this is a little bit technical okay but but I'll try and keep it as simple as possible there are two strands or two traditions when you look at, say, meditation leading to contemplation from the Carmelite method or the Ignatian method or the Salesian method, those method of prayers 
belong to what is called the cataphatic tradition. Now, cataphatic simply means you pray with images. You pray with images. So that, that's why scripture is important because it presents us with words and with images that we can focus on. And it brings us into relationship with God. So in that prayer, you never bypass the humanity of Christ in order to arrive at that place of contemplation. So it's always in and through the person of Christ. That's why the word of God, scripture has such an important place in that style of meditation. But then you've got another strand, which belongs to the apophatic tradition, which means there are no images, there are no words, and it's about emptying the mind and even the heart of feelings in order to simply be present to God. And usually it's in darkness, in not knowing. Now, for example, a classic example of this would be the cloud of unknowing, which is a mystical text, okay, about this form of prayer. But when people talk about centering prayer, for example, that also belongs to that tradition. Or you belong, or the prayer when you talk about a mantra, when you use a word, but you, you let go of the word to try and simply be empty of thoughts and words and be present to God in that sense. So that's the other form of prayer. And some people find that very, very good form of prayer. Personally, for myself, I find, for me, I find it better to stay with the person of Jesus in and through the word of scripture, and then to allow myself to be moved into that place then of not knowing, of simply being present to God in that sense. Because the aim of all prayer ultimately is to have this encounter with God, to be present to God. You see, if you look at your own relationship with your wife, for example, when you're not with her, you can be thinking about her. And it's probably nice for her to know that you're thinking about her and you let her know you're thinking about her. But there's no comparison between you thinking about her and when you're actually present with her. And this is, this is important because sometimes in our prayer, we can be thinking about God, but we're not present to God. And that's why St. Tre Teresa of Avila, whose feast day is coming up now on the 15th of October on Thursday, says, you know, prayer is not about thinking much, but loving much. It's about not thinking about God, but being present to God, who is always present to us. How would you differentiate then between thinking about God in prayer and say meditating? The reason I ask that question is I, I think, you know, some people might have both of those under the same umbrella thinking they're one or the same. But that's a very valid point that you made there that, you know, in prayer, you can be thinking about God, but not present to him. But yet, here we are talking about meditating on God. How do you differentiate the two there? Well, you see, thinking about God, meditating and thinking about God are basically the same thing. Okay, so I wouldn't really make a distinction between them because the purpose of meditation is to use the faculties, okay, to think about God. But we think about God in order to awaken love. And when the love is awakened, then we're present to God. And that's contemplation. We enjoy God's presence. But again, if we go back to the Nexia Divina, for example, just to give you a clear example of this, and just the format of the Lexio Divina. <clears throat> if you look at the four stages, the first stage, Lexio and Meditatio, is this thinking about God in order to awaken love. So when we begin to move into the Oratio, we're beginning to move. We're no longer the center. It's not us, but it's what God is asking us now to pray for. And then we move from that into being present to God. So when we look at those four steps, I want to explain it in a very simple way. The first step, the Lexio. When you stay with the piece of scripture, the question you're asking yourself is, what is it saying? What is it saying? So pay attention to the words. What is it saying? The second step, which is the meditatio, when you're staying with it, is if something has struck you from that, a word or a phrase, you stay with that phrase and you ask yourself another question. What is God saying to me? So what is God, God's addressing me now personally? And what's he saying to me through this word or this phrase? Then when we stay with that, 
when we move to the oratio, the third stage, it's another question. What is God now asking me to pray for? So having listened to his word, having chewed on his word, now I'm responding to what God is saying to me in and through that word. What is he asking me to pray for? That prayer could be a prayer of repentance. It could be a prayer of thanksgiving. It could be a prayer of intercession. It could be anything. But, but the key thing is, what is he now asking me to pray for? And then <clears throat> at that stage, we try and just become silent and to be present to God who has addressed us personally and how to be present to him. And that's different from thinking about him. It's now being present to him. And usually we will experience peace. We will have like a deep sense of peace, which is God's spirit present to us, not being present. It's not just a feeling of peace. It's an acknowledgement of his presence, which brings peace. Or it can be joy and it can be delight as well. Father Union, when you first began this type of prayer uh, at whatever stage of, of your life, now I know we made the point uh, in one of the previous talks that practice is key. You, you know, we have to, you have, it, this is a, a form of prayer, just have to keep going, keep going, keep going. It will become natural. But what, what challenges or, or difficulties did you experience uh, in starting out? And I'm just conscious, say, of, of anyone watching that wants to get into this uh, and they want to start out uh, and, and they're likely maybe to experience one or two obstacles uh, fairly quickly as they begin. What I would say is rather than starting with the difficulties, <clears throat> I would like to start with, you know, the, the benefits, if you like, of that. And then we can look at the difficulties really that we guys. To be honest, the normal way that the God operates, not that I'm speaking on behalf of God, but just from my own experience and from most people's experience, when you deal with people in spiritual direction, usually at the beginning of prayer, when we start things, usually there's a bit of a honeymoon period. Mm. Usually things go quite well and, uh, and we feel attracted or drawn to prayer, to this type of prayer. But like any relationship, the honeymoon period comes to an end at some point. And therefore, different questions then begin to emerge. And you kind of focus back on the question, am I in this relationship because of what I'm getting out of it? Or I'm in this relationship because what I can contribute to this relationship? And it's the same with prayer. Because suddenly, very quickly, you know, we become aware of how self-centered we can be, that we can be there because we're saying we're, we're spending time to be with God, but sometimes we can be there because we want to have a good feeling or a good experience of God rather than being present to God. And that was one of the difficulties I encountered in my prayer. I, that kind of praying once in a retreat with um, lowering your nets and having a huge expectation okay, that I was going to receive something from God. And then after a few hours when nothing was happening, I realized I was disappointed. And when I stayed with the feeling of disappointed, I realized that I had an expectation, which was not God's expectation. And the only thing I caught in the net was myself. And that was a big fish to catch in the net. And what I realized was that, what I realized then was that I had gone into prayer with a certain expectation of how God was going to operate, but he didn't operate according to my expectation. And that was my ego at work. And I had to realize, therefore, that, okay, I thought I was here praying. I thought I was here being present to God, but really, I was there with an expectation. And when you have expectations, it's very difficult to be present. And then I was very deflated when I realized, oh, my God, I actually wasn't praying at all. And I was there more for myself than being present to God. And then I felt annoyed and angry with myself then. So the deflation gave way to that. And I, I saw these birds trying to build their nest in a, in a hole of a tree. And this bird kept flying with this twig in its mouth, trying to put the twig into the tree. But every time I put it in, it was too big. So the twig kept falling. And it kept flying down and repeating it again and again and again. 
And there was me getting more annoyed when I looked at the bird. I says, you stupid bird. Will you never learn that you've got to put your head sideways to get that twig into the tree? Eventually he did it. But I realized the reason why I was so annoyed because what the bird was doing was exactly what I had been doing. I was trying to build my own nest and get God in the way I wanted God to come to me in prayer. But I had to learn God does not operate according to our script. He operates in his own way, but his script is even more wonderful than the one that you have. Because after that period of deflation, I was torn between praying with Psalm 60, which is, oh God, you're my God, for you I long, for you my soul is thirsting, or meditating on the cross. And I didn't know which one to do. So I decided then I would pray with the Psalm and then meditate on the cross. But an hour and a half later, I was still with the psalm because God had taken over. And in that psalm, when I was praying, it became a dialogue between God and myself. It was almost as if Jesus was on the cross speaking to me in and through the psalm. So the first part was what I was saying, oh, God, you are my God. For you, I long. For you, my soul is thirsting. That he was responding, my body on the cross, my body pines for you like a dry, weary land without water. So I gaze on you on the sanctuary to see your presence. So it was like this dialogue between God and me, not that I was initiating, but it happened because I had to let go of my expectations and allow God to take over. And when we allow God to take over, it's amazing what God can do in our hearts and in our minds. That's why I want to stay with that that's more essential to know that we can be working hard at prayer but god is even our desire for god is nothing compared to god's desire for us and god doesn't make empty promises the key thing as i said before is perseverance especially when you feel nothing is happening when nothing is going on because that is when god is most at work breaking in and through our defenses and being present to us. When you talk there about perseverance, um, now this is probably <laughs> the most unrelated thing to prayer, but I remember when, uh, particularly in the late 90s, early 2000s, when Tiger Woods was at the height of his game and people were asking him, like, what is the secret? What is the secret to your success? And he's, he said uh, three things. He said, practice, practice, and practice. It's the exact same thing here with, uh, with prayer. For anyone who has you know, every experience, uh, even the conversion to the faith, all of a sudden, you know, your eyes are wide open. Everything is absolutely amazing. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't feel any better, but that only, that feeling only lasts for, for, for a certain amount of time. Or it's like when someone goes away in pilgrimage and they're on fire, but when they come back and they're coming back into society and whatever, I guess the, the different things of life maybe uh, brings them back down to down to earth a small bit and all of a sudden they they may fall away they might feel deflated but it's that perseverance i guess it's like and i know we mentioned it before uh you know certain saints you like you've mother Teresa, saint john the cross who experienced this dark night of the soul where they just could not it was experience god in prayer themselves through their own senses uh and this heavy cross coming upon them yet it was to keep going, persevere, persevere, persevere. And I think you made a point as well in one of the first episodes that it's actually in these moments, in, in, in this perseverance, when you, you you may not want to pray, but you're praying and you're practicing and you're 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 just trying to do it. It's it's in those moments where uh where God can can be acting the most. Absolutely. And again, this is where you see it's important for people to understand this, you see. Trying to evaluate prayer by what we feel is a very, very shaky foundation. Mm. Our feelings are always changing in that regards. Okay, our feelings are never constant. And sometimes we get, if we pray only when we're feeling good, okay, it's like a relationship as well too. Like sometimes, you know, we not have the, the feelings in a relationship, but that doesn't mean you stop um, being loving towards the person in that regards. See, prayer is very important. It's about the perseverance is about making the commitment, like any relationship, it's making the commitment. And at those times when kind of we feel nothing is going on, 
That's not necessarily true at all. It's just that we don't know what's going on and that God is working away in the darkness. In that regard. And sometimes, as I said before, we're moving from the realm of the senses where we can evaluate this by what we feel to the realm of the spirit, which cannot rely on the senses to evaluate it. So we don't know what's going on, but we believe we have faith that God is at work. And it's at those times where God is actually pouring more of himself into us and be more active and us receiving more. But it's happening in darkness. It's what God is doing, not what we are doing. And over time, then we begin to realize it. But as you rightly say, you know, sometimes life gets in the way of our prayer as well, too. And things can happen which pull us down or make us, you know, our heavy weights on us. I remember once when I was when I was praying, uh, not when I was praying, I was giving a retreat, a weekend retreat. Now, it was also the time when I had been looking after my mother, who was very old at this stage. I was doing full-time care. So it was very rare that I actually got away. So I got away for this weekend retreat and I had carers looking after her. But no sooner had I arrived at the retreat that suddenly I got a phone call to say, that one of the carers had walked out and that the carers had an argument or disagreement among themselves. And here was I for the weekend on this retreat, wondering how am I going to manage, how am I going to manage this situation for my mother who needed full-time care? And here I'm on the retreat and I was desperate, okay. And it was really getting to me and I was finding it difficult to sleep. And at four o'clock in the morning, I was still awake, still praying, asking God to help. But I knew I had two long, very long full days ahead of me as well, too. At this stage, I was quite frustrated. And I was doing the novena of surrender prayer, which I find very, very, for me personally, is very helpful. I think it's very helpful during this period of COVID as well, too. But at four o'clock in the morning, not being able to sleep, being worried about my mother, knowing I had two very full days ahead of me, I just said to our Lord in desperation, ah, you take care of it like that. You take care of it. The following morning when I woke up, I kind of, I was kind of realized the way I said it was like, you know, oh my God, I didn't even say please. You know, I just said, I'm so tired, frustrated and fed up. You take care of this. Because I, I'm at my wit's end, basically, in that sense. You know, I'm at my wit's end. So shortly after that, short, I got a phone call from one of the carers saying that she was prepared to work extra hours and to take the other carer's place. So the situation was solved short term, but also became sorted long term as well too. But the gospel for that day, and it became my homily, the gospel for that day when I was meditating on it was about the widow in the gospel. The widow who went to the man and knocked at the door and asked to the unjust judge. And he says, I better give her what she wants because she's going to do my head in, in that sense. Not because it was justice, because you're really going to do my head in. And what I realized was my prayer in desperation in bed at four o'clock in the morning was very much like that widow's. I'm saying, I'm really at my wit's end here. I really need your help. I can't sort this. You better do something about it. And he responded to that prayer. And what I understood from that, like the widow, what I understood was, when we pray, God always becomes our servant. God always does what we ask. And Jesus says that to us. If two or three of you are gathered in my name and you ask anything in my name, I will do it. When we pray, the almighty God becomes our servant. And that is amazing when you think about it. And that's what he does. Because he is the one who lowered himself to become human. He is the one who lowered himself to wash our feet. Not because we're good, but because he is good. And he responds to us in our need. That's a, that's a powerful image, actually, when you think of God in prayer becomes our servant. This God of the universe is God who created us this divine majesty becomes our servant uh in prayer that's um i've never actually heard that before that's uh that's fascinating um so as we're talking about prayer the supreme prayer 
uh, of the church, of course, is the Eucharist. There's no greater prayer than, uh, than, than, than the Eucharist. So how does all this that, that we've been talking about um, so far, how does this all lead into the Eucharist? Uh, it's a very good question, a very good, important um, question to ask. To understand the Eucharist, we also have to understand prayer. prayer. And the Eucharist, the Eucharist is the prayer. It is the prayer of Christ on our behalf to the Father, where he offers himself. So Francis de Sales says that the mystery of the cross is not repeated in the Eucharist, but it is the continuation of that sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus happened once and for all on the cross, but it is continued in the sacrifice of the mass. And the key thing about prayer, let us remember, when we're talking about Christian prayer, the key thing about prayer is that the key agent in prayer is not us, it's the Holy Spirit. We're responding under the Holy Spirit, guidance to God. St. Therese of Lisieux says a wonderful thing. She says a wonderful thing. It always stayed with me, it always struck me. She says that when she looked at, her, at how much God loves us, and her feeble attempt to respond to that love. She was quite frustrated. She says, like, God, after all you've done for us, and the amazing way you continually pour out your love to us, and your love never changes, it's steadfast. And no matter what we do, even when we do wrong, when we sin, it doesn't change your love for us. You continue to love us as much as ever. How can I possibly respond to such infinite love. How can I respond to it? And she discovered the only way she could respond to God's love in any meaningful way was to borrow his love. And she says, when we pray with the Holy Spirit, we borrow his love in order to love him back. And that's the only way that God can be loved. You know, our human love is so limited in that regard. So we borrow his love when under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we respond to God in prayer. And what we begin to discover therefore is that when we talk about prayer, Jesus is always constantly at prayer for us. And prayer, ultimately Christian prayer is actually tuning into the prayer of Jesus who's always praying to us. Prayer is happening in us through the spirit of Jesus that has been poured into our hearts. So our prayer is tuning into what God is actually doing. And a good example of that is John 17, the great priestly prayer of Christ, who prays on our behalf to the Father. Father, they may be one as you and I are one. And this would be a good exercise, good prayerful exercise for maybe some of our viewers to do, is to go through John 17 and to allow it to become personal. So for example, when you hear Jesus saying, Father, I pray for those you have given me that they may be one as we are one, for example, then simply say, when you're praying with the bride, Jesus, you pray, you're praying that Brian who has been given to me may be one with me as the Father and I are one. So to put your name in the place of where he's talking about this. When we do that, it helps us to tune into the prayer that is already happening with Christ. So we need to understand this first before we can understand what is happening in the Eucharist. Gosh, like listening to yourself, to, to what you're saying there, even I'm being challenged by it insofar as when you're talking about, you know, really tuning in as to what's happening in prayer and tuning, because like so often, I know I'm the biggest culprit of it, but so often just with the, with the busyness of everything of, with, with work, with the children, with just life in general, and, and, you know, we'll always come and, and do our prayer every day. But even as you're, as we're doing it, sometimes, you know, sometimes it becomes almost an exercise for the point of an exercise and not being able to step away from 
everything that's going on in your mind, that's going on in your heart, um, trying to f- be there present in the moment, knowing what's happened uh, and to push everything aside. So, and, and, and now, and that's only in prayer. And now as we approach the Eucharist, as we're talking about, and again, I'm just thinking of so, so many times when trying to get out to get out the door, uh, you know, to mass and, uh, you know, one of the kids all of a sudden might get sick or have, there needs to be a nappy change or whatever. And by the time you get there, you're running, you might be a minute late in trying to keep him quiet and everything. And, um, and look, that's part and parcel of life. Yet just listening to you there and going, wow, I'm a, I'm, I'm one of the culprits here. I'm definitely one of the culprits here because it really puts it into perspective as to how we're to approach, uh, God and prayer. And I think that's something at times that listening to yourself there, I'm like, wow, I'm approaching prayer very much in the wrong way sometimes. Yeah, I wouldn't be too hard on myself, really, in that regards, too. And there's a little phrase I often use in spiritual direction with people. When we become aware of something and then we judge our past with our present awareness, which we didn't have before, that's not helpful. It's not good to shine the spotlight of your present awareness on your past. Okay. Okay, because it, it just makes us probably feel more guilty or, or that we're not reaching the mark, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What is important is to give thanks to God for the new awareness so we can move forward with this. Okay. The reason why I, I, I had to say that about the prayer, but understanding that Jesus is praying for us, because the Eucharist is the great prayer of Christ on our behalf to the Father. And you and I know that sometimes when we're present at the Eucharist, you know, it may be the last, there may be a lot of stuff going on in our minds and we may not be that present in that regards. Does that mean that the Eucharist is invalid? <laughs> it doesn't. And it's the same like when we don't feel anything in prayer or when we're present at the Eucharist, God is the main agent and God is doing this, making this prayer a reality in our lives in that regards. So, I suppose the image that I want to use, again, I'm taking it from St. Francis de Sales and he takes it from the Song of Songs. He says, we won't understand the Eucharist unless we understand the kiss of God. He says, because God, when he creates us, when he creates humanity, this is the kiss of God giving us life. When God becomes one of us, When he becomes human, when the word becomes flesh, Mary receives the kiss of God so that God becomes human in our lives. When we go to the Eucharist, when we receive him in Holy Communion, we receive the kiss of God because he enters into communion with us and we become one. So Francis de Sales tells us that what happens at the Eucharist is what happens at the Incarnation. Just as Mary was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and was open to receiving the word of God, who became flesh within her, also in every Eucharist, when the priest calls on the Holy Spirit, the epiclesis in the Eucharistic prayer, when he calls down the Holy Spirit, what happened at the Annunciation happens in the Eucharist because through the power of the Holy Spirit, the bread is transformed into the person, the body of Christ, whom we receive then in communion, who enters into communion with us. So just as Mary received the word of God in the Annunciation, at each Eucharist, Christ enters into us, so we become one body. And as Scott Hahn says in the Last Supper, in his book in the Last Supper, at every Eucharist, there is a wedding. And that wedding, you're invited to the wedding, but you don't realize you are the one that is being married. You are the one that is receiving the body of Christ. And there's an intimate communion there that is more intimate than marriage. And you're being made one with Christ who enters into you and becomes one with you. And as we read in De Ecclesia Eucharistia of of Pope St. John Paul II, in Holy Communion, we not only receive Christ, but he receives us. So I just want to take a quotation from St. Francis de Sales, okay, from my book, okay? 
which is um, created for love. And this meditation on the Eucharist, I mean, I won't have time to go through all of this, but if, if anyone's interested in really looking at this more in more depth, okay, there's this phrase, this quotation I want to read from him. He says, we also receive a similar grace in communion as Mary did at the Annunciation. Because not an angel, but Jesus Christ himself assures us that in it, the Holy Spirit descends on us. Heavenly power covers us with its shadow and the Son of God really comes to us. He can say that he is conceived and born in us. Truly then, the soul can respond with Mary. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me as you say. That's unbelievable. Um, I'm just going to just going to go to a, a practical point. Um, and again, I'm going to, to ask you because as you're describing what's happening in the Eucharist, it, it, that's phenomenal. It is absolutely phenomenal. From a practical point of view, in preparation for the Eucharist, even for, for lay people coming to, um, you know, co coming to Mass in preparation, mm -hmm. what, what advice, what tips would you give to, um, in preparation for the Eucharist to, to really be able to tune in and enter into this Supreme Prayer? Again, I would say something similar to what I've said before. Okay. When we talk about prayer or talk about the Eucharist, we're talking about the ability to have a focus and then to be attentive. So what, what I find personally very helpful, um, but I would do it on a daily basis in terms of the word of God uh, for the Eucharist is that to spend time in the previous day with the word of God. But even for the Sunday Eucharist, it would be very good if a person can spend time the week before that week doing an Alexio Divina on the gospel because that really will prepare you to open your mind and your heart to receive the word of God in the Eucharist as well too, to receive the person of, of Jesus Christ. So as I said before, you see, without a focus, we get distracted very easily. Mm. And that's why there's nothing better really, to be honest, than the word of God to help to give us a focus in that regard. So one practical way of doing this would be you know, in preparation for the Sunday Eucharist is the week before to do Lectio Divina throughout that week, even five minutes or 10 minutes a day on that piece of scripture. Because sometimes when you go to the Eucharist without preparation, sometimes you can't even remember what the gospel was. That's very natural, and very human. So it's to prepare yourself in that regard. Because it's like the parable of the sower, you know, sometimes we're like that cultivated soil and we receive it and things begin to grow but other times there's anxieties like the thorns or the bushes or the soil that's not been prepared and although god is giving us his word there's no room for it to land or to grow in that sense so therefore it's about again perseverance it's about practice in that sense and it's about making a commitment to being present to God in his word. So when we come to the Eucharist, our hearts are like that fertile soil ready to receive. Our disposition is one of receiving from God. I'm zigzagging a bit here now, but I'm gonna go back to just as you were, just before you read uh, there from your book. Uh, and you mentioned that the same grace that Our Lady experienced at the Annunciation, we're receiving at the Eucharist. And there was, that was a very important point in so far as Sometimes we can fall into the trap, maybe, and particularly if we're starting out in, in, in prayer of, you know, we're, we're reading the Gospels, we're reading the Word of God as an event in the past, okay, which it was, but at the same time, it's very much alive. So what's happening here in the Eucharist is not something that, it's not symbolizing something, but the, the, what happened in Calvary is happening the exact same moment here um at mass and that's something 
that's something that kind of struck me there as you were as you were chatting about our lady and enunciation that um sometimes you know I, I know from my own point of view i can i can sometimes tune out of that i kind of almost forget that you know what 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 what's actually happening here is real is the exact same thing that's happening now that that happened those 2000 years ago a very important point and perhaps maybe what we need to remember to appreciate that basically is the difference between god and us in that regard we are limited by space and time god is not god is an eternal now but god enters into human history in the person of jesus and transforms that history but with god there is no past or future there's only the present the eternal present the eternal now with god but we're limited, being human beings, we're limited by space and time. Although our desires are not so limited because we have infinite desires. And that's why what we find quite often, what we will find is part of, part of human nature is that we will often try to satisfy our infinite desires by settling for what is finite but it will never satisfy us. And that's the whole thing about addiction. The whole thing about addiction is we've got an infinite desire for something and we settle for something that we feel is going to satisfy it, but it can't because it's finite. And therefore we end up with what I think Thomas Merton called um, a descending transcendence. It, rather than becoming, you know, ascending, becoming more free when we are in relation with the living God, we become captured or enslaved by something which is less than God and makes us less than who we can actually be. And the experience of God is that we can never ever in this life or even in the next, I think even in eternity will be the same. We can never ever say we now have God fully. There will always be more of God to be enjoyed to be explored, to be experienced in that regards. And in this life, we see things, as St. Paul says, through a glass darkly. And even the most amazing experience we have of God is only an experience of God. It's not God himself. And it's only in the next life, when the veil is taken away, will we be able to see God face to face. And the deepest experience we've had of God in this life will only be a pale reflection of what it will be truly like when we're in complete communion and union with God in the next life. That's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. Um, gosh, like we're, we're after chatting for over an hour now and the time is absolutely after flying by. Um, just as we come to a conclusion, is there anything else you want to add I, I know we're kind of coming towards the end of our series on prayer but we're going to do another episode um again and that's going to be very much uh on saint francis de sales and the the busyness of of life of experiencing god and the busyness of 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 life but as we come to a conclusion here um is there anything you want to add or any key point that you want to reiterate the key point really for me that I want to reiterate is that sometimes we look at, we try, we get, sometimes we get kind of fixated with methods, okay, and looking for, um, if I can only get the right method, or if I can get the right book on prayer, if I can get the right guru, okay, then I'll be able to learn how to pray. The key thing is prayer is a relationship with God. And the key thing is perseverance is to spend time to make a commitment to God in prayer, especially when you don't feel anything, but to keep to that commitment. Because what you will begin to experience is that you may not experience things during the prayer time, and your prayer itself may be quite dry, and nothing seems to be happening. But what you will begin to experience in your own life is certain changes or transformation will be happening within you in your life, and, and will, which is a fruit of the prayer in that regards. God is never outdone in generosity. If we're generous with God, God is more than generous with us. And the problems or the difficulties that keep us from praying quite often is our image 
our, our idea of God. Because sometimes we've got false ideas of God. Uh, as you said earlier about, you know, God being like the, the judge or God being the one who's angry with us or if I give him this time, I might make him happy or stuff like that. Sometimes the, the, the big obstacle to praying is the image or the ideas we have of God. Okay, And that's why prayer is so important, because in prayer, we meet God himself. And he is the great iconoclast. He breaks all images of him. Because then we begin to experience him in a new and different way and understand him in a new and different way. But even with those experiences, he won't let us settle with that. He will always want us to move on further and further to experience him in a new and in a different way. To be present to him, not an experience of him. As Francis de Sales says, we must seek the God of consolations, not the consolations of God. So the focus is not on what we're experiencing or what we're feeling, but it's on being present to God, to be attentive to him. And that transforms and changes us. Father Yunan, thank you so much. That's um, like these series have been absolutely fascinating and they've been, they've been quite challenging, but in a good way. Like I, I, I know uh, a lot of the time when we leave prayer, there should be some kind of, little challenge towards us anyway even if it's something like you know what there's something uh, you know there's a resolution i'm going to make or something i'm going to work on uh to change for the better uh within myself or or whatever but these these episodes and prayer have been absolutely uh, fascinating and I, I thank you so much for that um would you mind just giving us a brief summary on uh on on the next episode on uh, on francis sales and the busyness of life in the next episode, um, the reason why I chose to talk about this because Francis de Sales, who's a doctor of the church, which mm. means the message is universally um, valid for all members of the church, had a particular, had a particular, uh, I suppose, liking for spirituality for lay people. And one author says that he, he was one of the main people who managed to remove spirituality from the monastic circles into the world, to bring it back into the world. So therefore it's a spirituality which is immersed in the world. And when we're immersed in the world, then there's busyness. We're very busy. But Francis Seal says that the spirituality of a candle maker, of a butcher, of a teacher, cannot be that of a monk. So therefore we have to learn how can we be in the world and live according to the way God wants us to live our vocation in the world in that regards. So, and for him, the key thing, therefore, is, and this is a little phrase that I'm going to focus on, that he says is, let us belong to God in the midst of so much busyness. The key thing for Francis de Sales is not that we're busy, not that we're active, but that our heart belongs to God. Because even our busyness will be an expression of our love for God. That sounds brilliant. I really look forward to that. Thank you, Father Yunin. Um, and Father Yunin, would you mind leading us in a, in, in a closing prayer? If it's okay with you, what I wanted to do today, because I was struck by the Office of Readings, and it's St. Columbanus, and it's a, lovely, it's a lovely phrase, a lovely piece of writing. That I want to use that as the prayer, if that's okay. So I'm going to read it. Okay. Excellent. I am a lowly creature but I'm still his servant. And I hope that he will choose to wake me from slumber. I hope that he will set me on fire with the flame of his divine love, the flame that burns above the stars, so that I am filled with desire for his love and his fire burns always within me. I hope that I may deserve this, that my little lamp should burn all night in the temple of the Lord and shine on all who enter the house of God. Lord, I beg you in the name of Jesus Christ, your son and my God, give me a love that cannot stumble so that my lamp can be lit but can never go out. Let it burn in me and give light to others. And you, Christ, our gentle saviour, in your kindness, Light our lamps 
so they shine forever in your temple and lighten our darkness and dispel the shadows of the world. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Father, the, the Son, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. 